This is Terry Bradshaw in the University of Vermont Horticulture Research and Extension Center Orchards. Uh, today I'm going to talk about fire blight. It's mid-June and during bloom a few weeks ago we had uh, pretty hot conditions and hot conditions around bloom are really conducive to fire blight. Uh, fire blight is a bacterial disease uh, unlike most diseases of apples, uh, which are fungal, bacterial diseases uh, have a couple of interesting um, components to them. Really, bacteria uh, as organisms need to live in some kind of a water solution. So uh, the fire blight bacteria is very driven by water. And in the tree, the water system is the vascular system of the tree. So fire blight tends to be uh, systemic within the plant uh, and can be really, really devastating. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later and I'll, I'll link to some uh, fact sheets about the biology of fire blight. But fire blight um, is caused by this bacteria, Erwinia amylavra, uh, and uh, the, the bacteria replicate very rapidly in conditions of heat. So uh, when you have hot conditions, uh, at certain times of the year, you can have real issues with fire blight. The reason why bloom was important is fire blight, the bacteria requires an entry into the tree to, uh, to, to get in and, and uh, cause infection. And that entry can be from a couple different things, either a pruning cut, uh, which is one reason why we don't summer prune when there's active fire blight in the orchard necessarily, although we're gonna talk about something different in a minute. Um, you also can get it from hailstorms later in the season, but the real time uh, is during bloom. So if you think about every blossom is an open you know, wound, if you will, into the tree, there's millions and millions of open entry points into the trees uh, in the orchard during bloom. So we did have a hot period during bloom. Uh, it was also dry. Uh, so in theory, we one of the main conditions to cause infection uh, didn't happen at this orchard. However, um, Fire blight is, uh, the bacteria is, is pretty crafty uh, and is able to uh, move uh, with fairly minimal amounts of water. That water could either uh, be the result of uh, dew, uh, even a you know, heavy dew or even a somewhat light dew, uh, or from spray events. So if you're spraying anything else in the orchard, um, that wetness can carry into, uh, carry the bacteria into the blossoms. So we're gonna look at some fire blight in this orchard. So I'm gonna spin the camera around and uh, we'll check it on it in a minute. What we see here is a crimson crisp tree. Um, this tree was managed organically for the first several years of its life, which means that the main um, uh, defense against fire blight that we use during bloom which is the use of antibiotics uh, was barred. And so this, uh, uh, we no longer treat this organic and I'll talk a little bit about this block, um, but the fire blight uh, bacteria and the disease really got a chance to get established in this orchard. Fire blight is evidence. You can see this shoot that I'm focusing on right here um, by this, this crook, you know, we call that a shepherd's crook. So the shoot is bent over, but really where this is, um, you know, where this infection came in was at this blossom. You can see there's a, uh, there's a fruitlet on here, which is, means there was a blossom there. And the, the, the disease moved into um, infect in that blossom. And now it's spreading systemically inside the plant um, back down the shoot. So typically fire blight is something you see, you know, starting at the ends of shoots and moving down. And that's one way that you can separate it out from um, something like nectria canker, where you might have damage, you know, cold damage or something down here, and then it dies from that point up. Um, so this is classic fire blight. Show a few more sections. Um, another thing you can see on this tree, hopefully the lighting is good, um, is this cankering on the trunk. Um, this is likely, um, you know, caused by fire blight, uh, older fire blight infection. You can see it's, it's, it's uh, established. Um, this is this is you know salvageable. Another thing you can find on this tree are you know numerous shoots that are just cut off you know old stubs, and that's because this tree and you can see the uh, the experimental number on here is part of a fire blight trial 
that's run by colleagues from Cornell University. I'm hosting it here at the farm. Um, so we in intentionally actually infected these trees. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Anna Wallace and, and Dr. Carrick Cox are studying different uh, treatments to uh, reduce the, uh, the, you know, the damage from fire blight. Um, but one thing I want to tell you, in, in a typical orchard, you're not going to spray Erwinia amylavera on your tree. This is another tree uh, next door to it that also is part of the experimental treatment. You can see these stubs from, from last year cutting it out. Um, and I'll talk about cutting it out in just a second here. Um, so moving on to the trees that are in this orchard that are not part of that experiment, you can see there is still fire blight in here. You know, this is a, this is a, a blossom that was affected. This is a blossom that was affected. Uh, and once you start to see fire blight, this can be a really explosive disease in terms of, of how it develops. And especially in hot weather, in, in real active uh, uh, shoot growth periods where you've got lots of you know, succulent growth, uh, if you've got a lot of nitrogen and you've got a lot of this real tender, flexible growth, um, it's very easy with a little bit of wind to kind of you know, tear up the, the surface of that and the bacteria to get in. You can have these kind of later infections we call shoot blight. So the main method for managing this disease at this time of year is to cut it out. Um, and this is a perfect day for removing this. Um, we actually are, are entering a, well, we're kind of halfway into a uh, extended dry, low humidity period, um, which is key. If we started making a bunch of cuts in this tree and it rained, uh, or if it were uh, you cut during the rain, or if it's, even if it's foggy, um, you can spread the disease. So there's a few different, uh, you know, modes of thinking. One is that uh, we should um, uh, remove, our, or excuse me, we should uh, sanitize our pruners with every single cut uh, that we make. And others say, you know what, you've got a lot of fire blight in here to get out and you're gonna spend a lot of time sanitizing cuts. So uh, you'd be better off to uh, just make your cuts and cut them far enough back that you're not gonna spread the fire blight. So when I'm making my cuts, I'm just using a standard pair of, uh, of, of hand pruners. Um, I do have alcohol out here in the, in the orchard with me. I'll, I'll show a few, you know, just the simple uh, sanit sanitation um, spray, but I, I, that's pretty simple to do. Um, we carry 70% alcohol solution. Uh, and that works. Uh, you can also use a weak chlorine bleach solution, but the chlorine can really tear up the uh, steel on your pruners. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're getting up in the tops of trees, you may need a, a pole pruner. That becomes a little bit more difficult to sanitize each cut. Um, a pair of loppers might be handy, uh, but usually this is on fairly young wood. So you're often not cutting into, uh, you know, older wood that requires a, a heavier lopper. But sometimes you might have to. So on this tree, I'm going to uh, spin around and take a look and um, we'll look at where we need to make some cuts to uh, get this disease out. So you can see on this shoot, we, you know, we have, you know, there was a there was a spur right here where there had been, you know, a blossom uh, and it's obviously infected. Same thing right here. Another infected spur. Uh, and what we want to do is is this bacteria is living inside this wood and will start to spread. It can spread in both directions, uh, but we get really concerned if it spreads down and into the trunk and then especially into the root system because some root stocks, including the root stock that, that's used in this block, uh, are susceptible, can be highly susceptible to fire blight. And if it gets into the root stock on a susceptible stock, it'll kill the tree. Um, as it is, you can, you can get stuck doing uh, a lot of you know, corrective surgery, if you will, um, to clean up fire blight, and that alone can really set back trees um, and kind of you know mess up your training system quite a bit. Um, but in this case, you know I'm looking at at this shoot in here. You know I've got a decent sized branch. You know this is an 18 inch branch with you know quite a lot of fruit clusters. But I've also got fire blight there. Got fire blight there. Um, fire blight there. Fire blight there. So I got about five six strikes. Um, so I, you know, this shoot's not going to do me any favors to keep around anyway. So I could take it back to this joint here. Um, 
However, if I go further out here, I see I've got fire blight here. I guess it's just that one there. But if I were to just take this fruit spur off, um, there's probably fire blight right in that area. So I would rather just get everything off. So I'm going to make a horticulturally bad cut, meaning I'm going to leave a stub, not making a nice clean cut. You can just watch this drop off. I did sanitize my pruners before I started with this. There we are. So now I've got this right here, this what we call ugly stub. You know, it's a few inches long. I cut back about six inches before uh, the symptoms. And what this does is I'll come back through in the winter and I'll cut this back off again. But this allows a piece of tissue uh, for that'll dry out. Uh, and as it dries out, hopefully you've cut out most of the bacteria, hopefully all of it. Um, but this allows a little dead piece of wood that you can cut off and it, it kind of acts as sort of a catch for the bacteria. So we take that kind of ugly stub. Same thing here. I've got this shoot here. I'm just going to snip that off. And same thing. Notice I'm leaving this ugly stub. So it's really important that we get in here and uh, get these out you know, pretty quickly. Um, I've had a, a, a student uh, this week and all he's been doing is cutting out fire blight. See, we've got some fire blight here, but it's not really affecting in here that I see. So I'll take it out and I'll, I'll pick these up when I'm done. There's a few different uh, thoughts on what to do with the prunings as you take them out. Often, uh, you know, the, the, the best thing, and of course the, the perfect can be the enemy of the good, uh, the, the best thing is to get all of these shoots out and put them in a burn pile. The problem with that, uh, there's a couple of problems. One is it can really slow down. If you've got a lot of fire blight and you want to get it out, uh, you know, in, you know, a, you know, you've got a good weather week to get it pruned out. Uh, it's more important to get it out of the tree than it is to get it off the ground. The other thing that can happen is if you are taking the fire blight out of the orchard, let's say you have a utility vehicle and, and you're collecting the, the prunings in a wagon, or uh, sometimes people will take a tarp and they'll, they'll, they'll put it on tarp and drag it through. You can, um, if you're driving through, you could, you could be brushing up against shoots, you know, as you, as you drive through and that can actively spread the fire blight uh, to new shoots. So you want to be really careful about that. So if you've got this weather like we have right now, dry, hot, uh, clear, sunny, uh, and these shoots have a chance for, you know, three days or so to dry on the ground, um, it would be best to cut them, let them fall, let that bacteria die out because there's no, you know, the living tissue will die out. The bacteria needs a, a living host to live in. Um, and so you'll, you'll, it'll break down um, and then you can uh, remove them maybe with a York rake, um, or you could even flail mow them and grind them right up into the, into the ground, but they've got to be dried out. Um, you don't want to be um, spreading stuff with a, uh, with a mower um, or other equipment um, and creating new infections. So that's really the, the, the key point that I wanted to talk about with fire blight. There's some other, um, other management tactics that, that, may or may not have much science behind them and, and often um, may not be recommended. Number one, um, I mentioned earlier that antibiotics, streptomycin, uh, are the, the key defense during bloom against fire blight. Uh, as soon as fire blight is visible in an orchard, streptomycin absolutely should not be used except for in a very specific case that I'll talk about in a second. But uh, the, just like, you know, streptomycin is the same stuff that, that we take if we have strep throat. Um, and just as humans or, or more so the bacteria that infect humans can develop a resistance to that antibiotic, fire blight, uh, the, the bacteria that causes fire blight can also develop resistance. So uh, if you are applying fire, uh, uh, streptomycin to an active infection where there are millions, if not billions, certainly billions of cells, um, you are encouraging the development of resistance. And uh, streptomycin resistance is a serious problem in certain uh, parts of the country where streptomycin has been used to manage fire blight during the summer outside of, of the bloom period. So if you see uh, strikes in the orchard, the last uh, uh, line of defense should be to get out streptomycin. Um, you really just need to be cutting and then passing through. I mean, it should be, this isn't a, a one and done uh, sort of event. 
uh, because you're going to miss some. You might not have cut far enough back, and so you might have some some further infections. So you've really got to keep cutting. Uh, you know, for the for I imagine in this orchard, uh, it's going to be probably a weekly or biweekly occurrence to just walk the orchards and and constantly cut out fire blight. Always have pruners on you. Um, now there are some materials that suggest uh, that that have shown some effect. So there's a few things to talk about. One is apogee. Uh, which is a plant growth regulator that's designed to shorten the internodes of vegetative shoots. And it's really done for pruning and kind of canopy management. Uh, typically put on, it's a little bit late to put on your first application right now. Um, usually put it on about petal fall and put on three, four applications going into the summer until the shoots stop growing. Um, but what happens is, it, you know, the, it causes a, a, a shortening of the cells um, and that actually creates a thicker cell wall and makes this, the, the shoot blight phase um, or the shoots less susceptible to, um, to fire blight. So that can reduce shoot blight, but not blossom blight. So that's one thing that can be done, especially if you've already started using Apogee, continue with it. The other um, are some, there, there's, there's, you, can, you can apply copper materials. Um, I'm a little hesitant to suggest copper this time of year for, for two reasons. One, copper is a heavy metal, so it will build up in the soil if you keep using it. Um, I haven't really seen that much, if at all, in orchard soils um, because we're not heavy users of copper, but certainly other crops like uh, grapes in parts of Europe, uh, tomatoes in parts of Florida, where these crops are very important, used and, 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 and copper is used uh, you know, very regularly every season, maybe multiple applications, you can get buildup and it can be toxic to plants, be toxic to uh, earthworms and other, uh, you know, soil biota. So that's one thing to avoid, but there are um, copper products that, that are applied at a low rate. And, and the reason I mentioned the low rate is the other drawback to using copper, which is that it can damage fruit um, pretty substantially, it causes, causes a russeting, um, where if you are selling fruit on a fresh market that makes the fruit completely unmarketable. Um, so again, I'm hesitant to recommend it, but a lot of folks, especially if they've got quite a lot of fire blight and they want to save the trees, might use you know one of these low dose coppers, a product like Badge or Quava. Um, there's a few other ones out there. Um, and there's another biological control product um, that has shown some effect or at least is often used by growers. But again, until I dig into the research, I'm not gonna necessarily recommend it. It's called double nickel, um, but that's something that a lot of growers have used, um, double nickel plus copper, some kind of low dose copper um, to try to manage this after it's been, uh, you know, after the orchard's been affected. But really, if you're just trying to spray your way out of this disease, it's not going to work. Um, you've got to get this wood out of the out of the trees. So here we are. I also want to highlight, just kind of scrolling down through the orchard a little bit. You know, this is one variety. This orchard is a, as an experimental orchard. It's not planted the way that growers would plant it. It's got eight different varieties that are randomized within the row. And you'll notice, I mean, it may be hard to see with this, but certain varieties, there's almost no fire blight. Now, they also, we only uh, inoculated the, um, the varieties that are used in the trial. Uh, however, other sections of the orchard, uh, which include, uh, which, which don't include any of the treatments, uh, might be reflective of, um, you know, some of the natural occurrence of this disease. Here we are a couple of rows over where we are not doing this fire blight trial. And I'll just kind of scan over some of these trees. Maybe I'll highlight some of the different varieties as I see them. Um, this one here is um, Florina Quirina. So this block is all scab resistant varieties. Um, so we don't do any management of apple scab. So it's a really good disease block since we don't have scab to kind of confound things. Um, and you notice as I move through, there's not much fire blight. I see a little spot, you know, up there, right there, um, but not much. I mean, minimal in this tree. Um, this tree here is um, topaz, crimson topaz. This is one of our fire blight uh, susceptible varieties in here. 
It's one of the ones that uh, Anna and Dr. Cox are using in their trial. And so this is a non-inoculated tree, so we, we did not add the bacteria, but you can see, you know, there's a, there's a strike there. Actually surprised at how little there is on this one. Um, what else do we have here? Galarina, which is not Gala. Gala is a uh, highly susceptible variety. Galarina for us has been relatively less susceptible. Oh, uh, let's see. Here's a Liberty. Liberty doesn't tend to get a lot of uh, fire blight, and you can see I don't see any strikes on this tree. And then we get over here to uh, Crimson Crisp, which is you know really the the worst one in this block. Um, and that's the one of the two that we're doing uh, the research with. And you can see strikes, strikes, you know, strikes here. Get my shadow out of the way. Um, this, is a, this is one section where we actually have two Crimson Crisp side by side and strikes, strikes. So these all need to be pruned out. Um, but this really helps to show, you know, the... Um, difference in varietal susceptibility to fire blight. So the key to uh, managing this disease again is to uh, manage it in two different ways. Cut it out with three different ways, really. Uh, in the winter, try to remove all cankers that you, can, that, that you see. Um, and that's important because that's the overwintering inoculum. In the spring, keep an eye on disease models and apply streptomycin as needed. And in the um, uh, during the season, after uh, any infection events occur, uh, be sure to cut it out. There's some others. You know, you want to be careful with nitrogen management uh, to not make trees more susceptible. Um, there are some biological controls, and that's some of uh, what's being tested in this uh, this trial in this block uh, to help to either boost the defenses of the tree, uh, you know, to make it, I wouldn't say immune, but to make it, uh, it less susceptible to the disease, uh, and also some biological controls that colonize the flowers and can outcompete the fire blight bacteria. Uh, so I'll talk about those at a later point. There's actually a, a good guide from Washington State University that I'll post uh, a link to on this um, to help explain that. So hopefully everyone has a good season and can manage their fire blight uh, effectively. Thanks.